and welcome to another edition of USRA Coalitions. Let's talk about it. I'm your host, Mike Coth. And again, remember, let's talk about it is geared towards drawing critical issues facing our community out of the darkness and into the light. We do so in the name of prevention and awareness. Just a reminder, the USRA Coalition is a partnership between the boroughs of Upper Saddle River and Allendale, New Jersey. Members consist of elected officials, parents, school administration, police, health professionals, local businesses, clergy, and members of local community organizations. The mission of the USRA Coalition is to educate and create awareness in our communities to prevent and reduce substance abuse and other health-related issues. And that brings us to today's guest. She has been a practicing clinician and psychologist for the past 20 years, most recently in Allendale and practice out of North Halden. She has been working with adolescents, adults, families, and in school settings. She offers therapeutic services. She acts as a consultant and a public speaker and other community services. And most recently, she is an author. Her new book, Why on Earth Do I Feel This Way, is on shelves at Barnes & Noble. She is Dr. Jolene Ahrens. Dr. Ahrens, welcome to the program. How are you? Thank you so much. I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. I am very excited to take advantage of this opportunity and really talk about something that is very passionate to me and I feel is very important for the community and schools. So thank you. <laughs> well, we're happy to have you. So let's talk about your new book, Why on Earth Do I Feel This Way? Understanding Anxiety and Mental Health Through Control Theory. You know, understanding anxiety is, um, it sounds simple, but it's not. You know, there's a, there's a number of misconceptions out there and, you know, your book speaks a lot of, you know, how anxiety is misperceived and misunderstandings that are out there. Tell us a little about your work. Yeah, thank you. Because, yeah, I feel that's the main point that I try to start out with in my book because anxiety is very misunderstood. You know, we hear the word anxiety thrown out there all the time and it's it's become, you know, pretty typical and common for us to talk about anxiety. But when I speak to students or parents and, and schools as, uh, as well, I always ask them, can anybody give me a definition of anxiety? And I've heard a lot of people describe symptoms of anxiety or what they've experienced, but nobody has been able to give me a concrete definition of what anxiety is. And so that's what I start my work on is trying to help people understand that anxiety is very misunderstood. And I want to be able to provide more of a context for people to understand what anxiety is, how it's presented or manifested and where it comes from. And then with that understanding to work towards what do we do with it? You know, so many people are, a lot of people are aware of their anxiety and they know what it feels like. But a lot of times people will say they experience their anxiety out of nowhere. You know, they don't know where it comes from and they don't know why they have this feeling. And I get that question all the time. Why me? Why do I feel this way? Where on earth does this come from? So with my clinical work, with my clients and my own research, I've been trying to really backtrack and get to the root of what anxiety is. And I feel like it's most helpful to think of it both in a more general scheme, but also under that umbrella, under specific um, focuses as far as how anxiety is addressed. So for me, I use anxiety as a very general term. It's any uncomfortable feeling that we experience. It could be anger, sadness, irritability, feeling scared, any uncomfortable feeling, that's anxiety. So that's not how it's presented in the DSM. You know, there's a list of 10 specific symptoms of anxiety and I don't necessarily go by that. I look at it as more of a general picture so that people can wrap their head around it a little bit better. So any uncomfortable feeling, that's anxiety. It's our body's way of saying, you know, something's not right here and I don't feel like my normal self. And it's that natural biological fight or flight response. So I've been trying to get to the root of where this anxiety comes from. And a lot of times it's you know, the common stressors that happen in day-to-day -day life, things that we are well aware of. But again, like I said, a lot of people experience anxiety and they feel like it comes out of nowhere. So I want to try to backtrack and understand what, what, what is it rooted in? You know, where is this coming from? So what I have found is that anxiety is ultimately rooted in a lack of control. So anytime that we don't have the level of control that we want or we need, that anxiety automatically increases. And so I use a scale from zero to 10 to gauge that level of anxiety, that level of intensity of anxiety, 
So the higher we are on that scale, the lower our personal sense of control is. And we want to be able to bring this anxiety down on that scale in a healthy way. And as that anxiety comes down on that scale, that control goes up. So we basically want to shift it on that scale. And I really make that control piece the focus of my work. And I feel like that gives people something more concrete that they understand they're working towards or more concrete where they can understand and conceptualize where this is coming from. So it could be something minor or something major where uh, my personal sense of control is limited, but no matter how big or small it is, my anxiety goes up on that scale. And it doesn't mean I have an anxiety disorder. You know, this is something that every single person has. Everybody has anxiety. And that's also another misunderstanding is that it's not, it doesn't pick and choose. You know, we all have anxiety and it does serve a purpose. We do want to use anxiety in a way that's helpful for us. But unfortunately, I think it's, it's perceived as something that is just not good and we shouldn't be having it. Um, so we want to really understand our own personal anxiety. And I like the scale because it gauges where that anxiety is on that scale and helps us shift our focus to what can we do to help bring the anxiety down, but also focus on what do I need to get that personal sense of control back? And so in my book, I go into different areas where this is applied and ways in which we can work on shifting that anxiety and the control on the scale. But I feel like overall anxiety has been really misunderstood. And when I present it as something that is a lack of control, that's what seems to hook people. That's what makes sense to them. And I've had numerous clients in my, in my office when I present the anxiety uh, or my, my theory on anxiety with control, that's when they start to really perk up and listen. You know, a lot of times they don't want to be there, especially adolescents. They don't want to be in my office and I don't blame them, but I'm trying to give them something. I want them to walk out of my office with something more tangible. And when I tap into that control, that's what gets their attention. And then you see the wheels rolling in their head and they're able to come up with examples one after another, after another of when they didn't have the level of control that they wanted. And that's when they were struggling. So that's what I've been trying to tap into people and help people understand that this is all of us. And it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't um, pick and choose who anxiety affects, but it's something every single one of us has, and we all need to pay attention to it. Yeah. Well, it sounds like it's something we can all relate to kids and adults alike. I mean, Absolutely. at this point, we're also hyper connected with our phones and social yes. media and even in our private lives and our relationships. There are certain things that are outside of our control. You know, much of what you say, it reminds me of a lot of Stephen Covey's work in terms of, you know, circles of influence and circles of concern and how, right. you know, much like you say, going up and down the scale of anxiety, you can you can expand your circle of influence or it can contract based on your focus. Right, absolutely, yeah, so, absolutely. So to that end, how can someone recognize where they are on the scale of anxiety and how could they use that to make sure they don't get to a breaking point? Yeah, great question. So there question. is a tipping point. Yes, so um, that scale, I'll just run through what I feel the numbers represent and you know, people can modify them as they need, but you know, a, a zero one on that scale means I don't have you know, stress right now. I'm not anxious, I feel great, I'm happy, go lucky. Uh, two to three on that scale is I'm fine, I'm neutral. So I'm not happy, go lucky, but I'm not stressed out either. Uh, four on that scale would be I'm starting to feel a little bit anxious. So maybe I'm anticipating something I don't want to deal with. So I can feel that anxiety coming on. I'm not in the midst of it yet, but I can feel it coming. Five is to the point where now I'm anxious. I recognize that, but I am managing it. So it's not out of control. It doesn't feel good, but I'm managing it. Six is to the point where now I'm getting a little bit more overwhelmed and I don't know what to do. I'm not managing it. I'm feeling a little bit more overwhelmed, but maybe if I talk to somebody about it, I can figure out what I need to do. Seven is to the point where now I'm more overwhelmed and I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to deal with it. I just want to be left alone. I don't want to deal with the situation at all. So it's more of an avoidance space. Eight and nine are to the point where now it's more, uh, it's, it's more overwhelming to the point that's concerning where we don't want to, we don't want to be here. We don't want to be at that eight, nine or 10 range. That eight or nine is where I'm very overwhelmed and I can't focus or concentrate. I'm more reactive. I'm snapping at people. I could be raising my voice or yelling. Um, I'm not at a place where I can have a calm conversation and walk myself through this. And 10 is that ultimate overwhelming anxiety where I could be having an anxiety or panic attack not necessarily that may not be how your anxiety is manifested, but it's that that level that is just too overwhelming for us to manage. And 
we definitely can't focus or concentrate or talk about it at that point. So that's where our brain is really on fire. And I can get into the more of the neuroscience maybe another time, but you know, our brain is so active at that point where we can't calm down and focus in our frontal lobe and be able to problem solve and think through the situation. So if people can use that scale as a gauge to start to pay attention to where their anxiety might be at, um, how intense is it? And when it gets up to an eight, nine, 10 on that scale, that's where I recommend focusing on calming the nervous system. You want to calm that brain, calm the nervous system. And we do that by engaging in whatever works for us, really. Exercise is a great way, just taking space from people, listening to music, doing art, um, reading, whatever works for you, yoga, meditation, whatever works for you to calm your body and calm that nervous system, that's what we want to tap into. I don't want people thinking about why I'm up there, you know, what got me at an 8, 9, 10, what I should be doing. It's not where we should be thinking. Uh, we just want to calm that nervous system. So when we get to an 8, 9, 10, that's a flag going off for us. Um, when we are towards the top of that scale for a prolonged period of time, and we haven't had the healthy relief we need to come back down on that scale and get some control back, typically what happens is that we go into defense mode. And, you know, people typically are not thinking about, oh, my anxiety is high, my control is low, I need to figure out how to bring my anxiety down. We're not thinking about that. We just know what it feels like to be at the top of that scale. And it's an awful, awful feeling. And so if we don't know what to do to manage that anxiety and that awful feeling, we're going to reach for whatever's at our fingertips to help alleviate that feeling. And our brain needs some relief on that scale. We can't live up here at the top of that scale. We need to have some kind of relief. And if we don't know what to do, we're just going to reach for whatever's at, the, at our fingertips. So if drinking or using substances is right there and available, you bet that brings that anxiety down. Unfortunately, that works. But that anxiety goes right back up on that scale. It's only a temporary relief. And it, it's more of an avoidance mechanism. And that's what our defense mechanisms are, is avoidance. I'm going to find any way to avoid mentally and emotionally processing what's causing me to be up here, what got me up there. And so, you know, substance use is definitely an avoidance mechanism, self-harm, um, you know, avoiding people, avoiding places, any kind of avoidance mechanisms. We all have them. And so that's something that we want to try to pay attention to as well, is that we all have these defense mechanisms, but we may not necessarily be aware of them unless they're blatantly obvious. So those avoidance mechanisms get us stuck in this trap where, you know, we, we engage in them and they give us kind of like a false sense of control. You know, they alleviate that awful feeling, but I'm not gaining my actual personal control back. And so I just go right back up on that scale. And if drinking works before, I'm just going to keep doing it again and again and again, and we get stuck in that trap. And so we want to be able to, again, shift our focus in and bring this anxiety down to bring up that control. And, you know, one other thing that happens when we're at the top of that scale and we don't get that relief that we need, the healthy relief that we need, is that because our brain can't function at this level nonstop, eventually what happens is that we feel like we hit a wall and we feel like I can't do this anymore. I'm done. I don't care about things I used to care about. My motivation to do things I used to do is gone. I'm done. I'm physically, mentally, and emotionally wiped out. That's where depression comes into play. So depression is more of a continuum of that scale. And that's often a misconception too, because I hear a lot of people talk about and other providers talk about depression and, and anxiety being two separate things. And it's not. The depression is a, is a symptom of that anxiety. You know, it stems from that anxiety. And so, you know, when we're in that state of depression and Obviously, we don't want to be there, but if we're trying everything that we can to get out of that depression and nothing's working, there's where we're going to start to feel helpless that I can even do anything for myself or hopeless, you know, that this is ever going to end. And so it lends to these thoughts of feeling, you know, so, so wiped out and in questioning, you know, well, I don't know how to get out of this. Everything I've tried doesn't work. Nothing's getting me out of this. So is this how I'm going to feel for the rest of my life? Because this sucks. You know, I don't want to feel this way for the rest of my life. I would rather not wake up tomorrow than to feel this way for the rest of my life. And there you have your first suicidal thought. So you can see how this just progresses so easily when we don't have that anxiety under control. And that's why I focus so much on getting that anxiety under control. Because when I have clients who come to me with severe depression and suicide thoughts or, or even attempted suicide in the past. I don't focus on those symptoms. I'll use them as mile markers because obviously we want those symptoms to decrease. 
but I'm tackling the anxiety. I'm tackling the root cause of that. When I'm able to help them get that control back, those depressive symptoms subside. So it's really, you know, rooted in that lack of control. And that's what I want people to understand that, you know, and, and help kind of concretize this idea of anxiety, that this is something that we can tackle and we can prevent those depressive symptoms and suicidality. We can prevent it. Absolutely fascinating. So, you know, you mentioned a boatload of things there. And one thing that stuck out to me was how, you know, some of the coping mechanisms that people will use, you know, like drugs and alcohol, although they're effective, they're, they're effective in the short term, they're really somewhat superficial. Right. So, you know, you're really just scratching the surface of the soil and you're not digging down deep to the root of the issue. And that's what you're talking about, getting to the root cause. And yep. So when you talk to people about control, it sounds somewhat like a mental exercise, a focus. Yeah. And in that, you know, how they say that, you know, pressure, we feel these pressures from all around and whatever emotion causes this pressure, you know, they say pressure could burst a pipe, but pressure could also make a diamond. Right. So how do we give people the tools to make sure that we exhibit cool under fire and come out like a gem on the other side? Right. Yeah, that's a great question. So part of understanding the anxiety is uh, learning, learning our own thought process, you know, understanding how we interpret situations and how those interpretations trigger what I call these automatic thoughts, the thoughts that pop into our head and really trigger that anxiety. So we want to pay attention to what are those automatic thoughts. They're oftentimes assumptions or anticipatory thoughts. And once I start assuming something, I believe that it's true. And then one assumption will lead to, lead to another and that'll lead to another and another and another. And they just snowball until I'm thinking about the worst case scenario. And I become completely completely consumed in that situation, in those thoughts. And that's where the anxiety lives. That's where the anxiety is, is rooted, or that's where it's really taking control over our focus and it just completely consumes us. And we're not able to focus on what's actually happening in the moment. So one exercise that we wanna to try to do is pay attention to those thoughts. When I start to feel uncomfortable and I'm going higher on that scale, I need to pay attention to that feeling and try to rack my brain about what I'm worried about. What am I anticipating? What am I afraid of happening? So for example, you know, if a student has a test tomorrow and they're not prepared for it, they're anxious because they're not feeling so prepared. If they felt prepared, they would have a higher level of control. They wouldn't be so anxious. So if they don't feel prepared, that anxiety is a bit higher on that scale. And one anxious thought of, well, I'm, I'm not prepared for this test. That means I'm gonna fail tomorrow. That's their first automatic thought is I'm going to fail. And that thought's gonna trigger the next one of, well, if I fail the test, I'm gonna fail the class. If I fail the class, I'm gonna fail this semester. If I fail the semester, my GPA is gonna go down. I'm not gonna get accepted to a good college. My parents are gonna be disappointed and on and on and on it goes. So we wanna pay attention to the snowballing of all of those thoughts and review those thoughts and ask ourselves, well, where's the evidence or proof that this is true? Do I know for a fact that I'm going to fail the test tomorrow? I don't. I don't have that proof. And more times than not, we don't have proof to support our automatic thoughts, but they just take off and they take complete control over our focus. And so we want to be able to shift our focus from those automatic thoughts to what's actually happening in the moment. Now, a more valid concern may be, I'm not going to do well on the test. So if that's my concern, then we want to problem solve. We basically want to identify what is within my control. What can I do? If this is my concern, what are my options? Let's come up with a plan A. And if plan A doesn't work, what's plan B? And if plan B doesn't work, what's plan C? So in that exercise, just by coming up with options and problem solving, there I'm training my brain to think differently than what it's been used to. It's our brains naturally go feed into this anxiety and feed into those anxious thoughts. But if I'm able to bring my focus back to what I need to be doing in the moment and what is within my control and what my options are, I'm training my brain to think in a more logical step-by-step -step way. And our brain doesn't naturally do that. That's the mental exercise. So I call it a cognitive shift. We're shifting our focus from those anxious thoughts to what I need to be doing in the moment. What's my priority right now? So if I'm preparing for a test tomorrow, let me carve out time in my schedule today. Let me review my notes. Let me call a friend if I have some questions. Let me review my, my uh, study guide. Those are all things that are within my control that I can utilize to prepare myself as best I can for that test. And so we want to practice this, what I call flexibility, flexibility in thinking, where we're training our brain to do this cognitive shift, but also understand that I'm, my ultimate goal is to do the best I can. And to not put these expectations on myself that I have to get this A. 
And if I don't get this A, then that means I failed. That's another area where anxiety spikes up. And we want to be able to work in this gray area where it's not all or nothing black and white. I want to recognize that I'm working hard. I studied as much, much as I could. I know I'm a good student. I'm not blowing this off. Um, you know, I'm doing what I can. And unfortunately, today I didn't perform as well as I would like, but it, it doesn't mean that I'm not a good student. It doesn't mean that I'm not smart. It doesn't mean that I'm not going to do well in my future because I didn't do well on this test. So we want to have that middle ground thinking. And I feel like that's where, especially adolescents get stuck. It's, you know, they have these pressures on themselves where it's all or nothing. I have to meet this expectation. And if I don't, then I failed or I'm a disappointment or I'm not good enough in some capacity. And it's internalized that way too. So then it takes a hit on our self-esteem as well. And that's a whole other factor that feeds into the anxiety. Well, that's sage advice. I mean, really age old wisdom, do your best. And sometimes when we're searching for answers, don't look for the answers. Sometimes you just have to ask the right questions. So I'm right. going through those mental activities, asking the correct, correct questions and right. hey, just be positive. Always make lemonade out of lemons. There That's you go. Yep. Yep. All Absolutely. right. Well, listen, we've come time to the program where it's time to get positive with us. Time to go right. person 10. Excellent. All right. So you got four downs. <laughs> so you got four questions. Okay. You get to the third question. After you answer it, you have the option to kick or stick. You can, you can opt not to answer it or we can go ahead and go for it. So okay. are you ready to play? I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, tis the season first down. What's your favorite holiday song? My favorite holiday song. Um, that's a good one. Um, you know, I may have to go with my husband on this one and uh, Bruce Springsteen. Um, what's the name of it? Uh, I'm blanking on the name of it. He'd be shaking his head at me right now. Do you want to use a lifeline? <laughs> sure. You want a little help in this one? Yeah. Is Santa Claus is coming to town? Yes, thank you. Uh, it's awesome. <laughs> I remember as a kid, my parents had that on vinyl. Oh, yeah. 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 It's awesome. That's crazy. Yes. Awesome. That's a good one. That's a good nice. one. A classic one. <laughs> All right. Second down. Uh, listen, you're a psychologist. You're a clinician. What do you do to unwind when things are tough? How do you relax under pressure? So I tend to start my day with focusing on that. Um, once my kids are off to school, I go out for a run or I do yoga. That's my time to just mentally kind of focus on myself. And I feel like once I get that physical energy out, I'm good to go for the rest of the day. You know, I feel like I'm able to focus and do what I need to do, but I've noticed when I don't get that exercise or when I, yeah, when I don't get that physical release of energy, um, I'm irritable. I'm, I'm snappy, you know, I'm just not feeling my best self. And so I've noticed that that's something I need. It's like my medication that I need to get my day going. Um, but I enjoy that. I enjoy being outside. I love going hiking. My kids love hiking. We love to be outdoors. So being outdoors really is, is my number one thing, but definitely exercising. All right, cool. All right. Well, we're moving the ball. We're moving along third down. I think it's third and short. Okay. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> it's movie night. At the Aaron's house, you guys are just sitting back, relaxing. Maybe you want to stream your favorite show. What are you guys putting on? So we we already had this conversation today. <laughs> We're going to watch Home Alone tonight. <laughs> nice. So, That's great. That's, That's a classic, too. Yes. Yep. Now, that can be considered Elf. a Christmas movie, right? Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Good. Good <laughs> deal. Uh, we're into Home Alone 2 these days in the Coke House. Okay. So uh, I think they like the New York aspect better. Go, gotcha. go for here. <laughs> All right, listen, we've come to fourth down. You kicking or sticking? I'm sticking. All right, let's go fourth down. If you had the ability to have dinner with anyone in the history of the world, one night, one night only, who would it be? Eleanor Roosevelt. Wow, that's a great pick. Yeah, I just admire her work um, in so many ways and, and her, you know, her own personal struggle. She struggled with mental health as well, but just her passion and drive for, you know, the work that she does across the board. And it's so relevant to, to today. Um, you know, it's just interesting. I, I just read so much about her and, um, you know, one of her speeches that she did in, in 1941, you could have taken that and said it today and it would be, you know, you wouldn't think it's from that time, you know, just speaking about, um, you know, how it's no ordinary time and really talking about the culture of the world and, you know, rights of, um, you know, uh, equal rights for uh, different races, women, you know, equal rights for everybody. And, you know, it, it's crazy that 
we're here in 2020 and that speech in 1941 is still where we're at. So it's, it's sad to me, um, but I would love to speak with her and, you know, just to get to know her and her work even more. That's an awesome choice. Talk about like a modern first lady, like a trendsetter. Like that's yeah. how first ladies operate. She really set the standard. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, she really uh, broke the mold. Again, ahead of her times, no doubt. Yeah, absolutely. Well, again, the author is Dr. Jolene Ahrens. The <laughs> book is Why on Earth Do I Feel This Way? You can find this on your shelves at Barnes & Noble, and it is soon to be in digital version yes. out on Amazon. Yeah, it's on Amazon as well, just the hard copy. But yeah, the, the e-version is soon to come. <laughs> All right, great. Well, Dr. Ahrens, thank you so much again for your time. We appreciate you coming on the program. We will have you again in the future. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great. Thank you. Sure. And that's all this this time. It's USRAs. Let's talk about it. Remember, our goal is to drum up awareness and prevention. And to do so, you got to pull up a seat at the table. I mean, as hyper-connected as we are with social media and our phones, sometimes it's just best to go old school. So pull up a chair, have a chat. Because remember, if, you don't, if you're not at the table, you might be on the menu. That's it for this time. Take care, folks. Have a good one.